Order, order. <laughs> Under the provisions of Standing Order Number 1A, I am now required to ascertain whether John Burko is willing to be chosen as Speaker. I call Mr. John Burko. Thank you, Mr. Clark. What a pleasure it is to welcome you back to this place. As you add the accolade of Father of the House to the many achievements of your long and distinguished career. Next Sunday, you will mark 47 years continuous service to your constituency of Rushcliffe, to this chamber, and to our country as a whole. You are held in great affection and esteem on both sides of the House, and I am sure that I speak for all colleagues in wishing you well in your new role. If the House so permits, I shall be honoured to serve as Speaker in this Parliament, which, thankfully, across the parties, is more richly diverse and representative of modern Britain than any of its predecessors. I will strive to ensure that all parts of the House are heard fully and fairly and, as always, I will champion the right of backbenchers to question, to probe, to scrutinise and to hold to account the government of the day. Finally, Mr Clark, I referred admiringly to your 47-year tenure. (laughs) It may come as a relief to colleagues to know that I have no pretensions to seek to serve for anything like so long, (laughs) either either as a parliamentarian or, indeed, in the chair as Speaker. That said, we appear to be destined for testing times. I offer myself to the House as a tested speaker. Uh, May I thank you, Mr Burko, for those uh, kind and uh, flattering remarks, uh, particularly referring, as you repeatedly did, to my longevity, (laughs) which is about the only non-controversial fact you can assert. About my parliamentary <laughs> career. <laughs> I call upon Mrs. Cheryl Gillan to move the motion. I beg to move that the Right Honourable John Simon Burko <laughs> do take the chair of the House as Speaker. And can I start by adding my belated congratulations to the Father of House, the Right Honourable Member for Rushcliffe. Uh, He took over earlier this year when we sadly lost another member of the 1970 intake, the very well-respected Sir Gerald Cuffman, of whom the leader of the opposition said he loved life and politics. And I can honestly say that that can be said of you too. Uh, And as Mr Burko said, having served in all of the departments of state virtually and all the great offices throughout your long and distinguished career, It's a tribute to your record of public service and your resilience that you preside over the opening proceedings of our Parliament today and the election of a new Speaker. Whilst welcoming all my colleagues returning to the House, who are naturally familiar with the Speaker's role, 
We are all pleased to welcome new members across all sides of the House. However, they may not realise that the Speaker's office, under this name, goes back only a mere 640 years. (laughs) The Speaker was then the agent of the King and was afforded little protection. If the agent of the King offered bad news, he suffered the monarch's wrath, and no less than seven speakers were beheaded between 1394 and 1535. Fortunately, the job description has changed since then. And uh, our modern speaker protects us and our rights as backbenchers without fear of losing his head. Except, I have to say, when members misbehave in this chamber. (laughs) Now, compared to the father of the house, and yes, with 47 years' experience, I'm just a youngster in this place. But over the 25 years I've served in Parliament, I've seen many changes. The Whigs have gone, except today one, for a state occasion. The hours have changed. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, the wigs have gone except one or two. have changed, the committees have increased, the technology has advanced, the media never sleeps, and the challenges of the job of the Speaker continue to multiply. And having been our Speaker since the 22nd of June 2009, I have seen the Right Honourable Member for Buckingham rise to those challenges and grow in this job. He has shown himself to be utterly impartial and fearless in defending the House of Commons from all comers, whether it be over mighty ministers or a raucous media. He is a determined champion of opening up our democracy, bringing in reforms that have made Parliament accessible to over 100,000 schoolchildren each year. He is an effective speaker who has used his office to reach out to people across our country. He is an energetic ambassador for Parliament throughout the United Kingdom and around the world, but he is also a devoted and hard-working champion for his constituents in Buckinghamshire. These are not my words, but the endorsements from the Right Honourable Members for Sutton Coalfield, Normanton Pontefract and Castleford, the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister. But my favourite endorsement is from the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham, standing by the chair, who said on his reappointment in 2015 that he may be small in stature, but make no mistake, in the office of Speaker, he is a giant. (laughs) Perhaps it's true, good things do come in small packages. part in proposing him for Speaker, I have always found him to be scrupulously fair, never allowing his views to compromise his impartiality. Although I think on all sides of the House we can agree he is no stranger to controversy, (laughs) I think he annoys members of all the front benches from time to time, which is probably a testament to his even-handedness. He fosters a sense of community amongst those who work in the precincts and applies himself with vigour to all the many and varied tasks that fall to the realm. But he also has qualities, which many of us wonder at. His ability to recall obscure information on members. Uh, I warn you members of this. His loquaciousness and command of the English language. And in particular, please note Father of the House, his ability to remain in the chair for inordinate lengths of time. (laughs) The record being an 11-hour, 24-minute, uninterrupted stint during the Syria debate, causing much admiring comment about the strength of his bladder. (laughs) 
childlike qualities aside, his performance in the chamber is also matched by his record outside. He has hosted over a thousand events for charities in Speaker's House and presides over the administration of this place with great patience and good humour, to which I can attest. This Parliament, like all that have gone before, will have its own character and present its own challenges. Over the next few years, our country will go through the great changes that people's democratic votes have presented to us in this House. And at the same time, we face the very real threats to that freedom and democracy and our precious way of life, which has been thrown so starkly into focus with the cyber attack on our NHS, the two unspeakable acts of violence during the election campaign, the death of PC Keith Palmer, and of course, the loss of our colleague, Joe Cox, who was taken from us all a year ago this week. As Speaker, he has always acted swiftly to join others with words and acts of reassurance, and I was proud to see him in Manchester standing shoulder to shoulder with the community that had come under such lethal attack. In times like this, and in all our deliberations in this House, we need the experience, maturity and commitment to our Parliament, which I believe is shown by the Right Honourable Member for Buckingham. His devotion to this House and this country cannot be disputed. He has served this House and us as members with strength and fortitude, and I have great pleasure in commending him to the House to serve as our next Speaker. Uh, the question is that Mr John Burko do take the chair of this House as Speaker. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. <laughs> the ayes have it. Colleagues, before I take the chair as Speaker-elect, I wish first to thank the House for the honour that it has again bestowed upon me. I am aware that it is the greatest honour it can give to any of its members. I pray that I shall justify its continuing confidence, and I propose to do all within my power to preserve and to cherish its best traditions. I want, if I may, just to say two other things. First, and yes, it's a repetition, but I think it's a justified repetition, isn't it marvellous to see the right honourable and learned gentleman, the member for Rushcliffe, as father of the House and back here in rude health? Yeah. And secondly, in welcoming the presence of all colleagues today and congratulating all those in all parties who have been re-elected. I hope experienced members will understand if I pay particular tribute to the, I believe, 87 members newly elected for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever else you have done or will do in the course of your careers, there will be no greater honour than that which you have just attained as an elected Member of Parliament. And I'm sure each and every one of you will be very conscious of your responsibility to your constituents. 
rest assured the Speaker will look out for you and be very keen sooner rather than later and more frequently rather than less frequently to hear from you. Mr. Speaker-elect, Mr. Speaker-elect, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the Prime Minister's fault, or I gave her the nod. The Prime Minister. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, Mr Speaker-elect, to all those who are new members, you see, you can be in this House for 20 years and still not always know what the protocol is going to be, but there we are. Mr Mr. Speaker-elect, on behalf of the whole House, may I congratulate you on your re-election. At least someone got a landslide. (laughs) Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, thank you very much, and I follow the Prime Minister in the remarks she made about the importance of the work we all have to do in this Parliament, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But firstly, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Rushcliffe on becoming Father of the House. He seemed to me to be a very well-established MP when I entered the House 34 years ago. (laughs) And uh, I've never quite forgotten the image of the Member for Rushcliffe in the tea room, wearing hush puppies, eating bacon sandwiches, drinking super-strength lager and carrying a cigar whilst taking a break from a debate on healthy living. (laughs) And he's had a very long and distinguished career in this, uh, in this House and uh, punctuated this year by his speech in the Brexit debate during which he lamented that his party opposite had become mildly anti-immigrant. A newer development that that might be is open to debate, but I'm sorry to note that it's also, to put it generously, at best mildly anti-worker, anti-disabled people, anti-pensioner and anti-young person as well. I'm sorry today. Um, but... Um, It's all right, it's all right. Mr Speaker, it is customary on these occasions to congratulate the returning Prime Minister, and I absolutely do so. And I congratulate her on returning, and I'm sure she will agree with me that democracy is a wondrous thing and can throw up some very unexpected results. (laughs) And I'm sure... And I'm sure we all look forward to welcoming the Queen's speech just as soon as the coalition of chaos has been negotiated. (laughs) 